March 18, 2019, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this, indeed, is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com and also heard in a variety of other places, including further on down the stream by your fondle slab of choice, your applicable application, and all that good stuff when you go out and get the podcast later on. But we are live on a Monday, or a moon day, as it were, and that means, generally speaking, actually, <laughs> believe it or not, we are up to part 20 with Jordan Maxwell, which has been a uh, a series on religion, uh, fielding a lot of questions from you guys, but also going forward with some of the information that Jordan already had locked and loaded uh, before we ever started, of course, even in... Now, what will be 40 hours? <laughs> Can you believe oh, that? When we're done tonight, Jordan, 40 hours of uh, discussion on this, we have not covered all of modern Western religion, not even close. But anyway, let's start out this way and ask you how you're doing. Well, I think, okay, <clears throat> we'll find out as we go along. We'll see where I am. I think I'm doing okay for the moment. Ah, well, you know what? You guys can always check in with Jordan and see how he's doing for yourself, if you like, by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's, number one. Number two, uh, you can go over there and join the Research Society, get in a lot deeper on this topic and many others that Jordan has covered over the years. Of course, there is new material being added all the time. Uh, it is huge over there. There's audio, video, books, articles, you name it, uh, in the Research Society. But why did I say you can just check in and see how Jordan's doing? Because you can email him there. And it is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's, and therefore, you email there, you're going to actually get in touch with Jordan. Uh, also, there's a PayPal donation button over there. And, uh, you know, things like that. So you could contribute to his well-being while you're asking him how he's doing, too. <laughs> how about that for that direct response? Hurt. No, it couldn't hurt at all. Nice. Uh, you know, and, and, and of course, I, I encourage you guys to do so. I'm a member of the Research Society myself. There's a one-time fee for doing that. Now, that money goes to the webmaster uh, to, to help continue that project because there are multiple terabytes of information still to be uploaded to the Jordan Maxwell Research <laughs> Society. Uh, but they, but it is a work in progress, right, Jordan? That's right. There's tons of stuff coming yet. And, and we've got enormous amounts of material, pictures and documents and research papers on all kinds of subjects, and especially pictures showing you you know, showing you in your face what the symbols mean and where they come from in the churches and what they actually mean and then all the dark research going on behind government and banking and military and mm -hmm. education, all the dark stuff that we're not being told ever is on my website, on the research website. Right. And you can also uh, join the research website for one-time contribution. Just one-time contribution gives you a lifetime subscription. Right. And, and like I said, I'm over there. I, I got to tell you, every time I go in, I learn something new. Now, there are a lot of visual images, but there's also audio, like I said. Uh, there is a, a couple of video pieces, links to some things that are not often discussed by anybody else. Gee, I wonder why. Uh, you know, and, and, and tons of, um, well, illustrations of all sorts. So, and not just on religion, but there is a deep section on religion over there as well in the research society. But in the public section, like I said, jordanmaxwellshow.com, there's a public section, there's the private section, there's also just, you know, hey, interact, email Jordan, make a donation, whatever. And there's a couple of videos you can uh, stream as well. Anyway, all of that, and we'll talk about that a little more. But we got to get on with this uh, with this episode here because this is the twentieth. I can't believe that we've done twenty this way. Now we we've done other <laughs> shows. <laughs> you and yeah. I have had other discussions. Um, one of them was was quite was was quite amazing and was brought up to me recently, uh, where where it seemed like we we really it, it should be like the A episode as opposed to one of this because we spent a lot of time on religion. And one of the topics which came up during that show was the concept of angels. Now, 
this person who has been listening that far back wrote to me and said, you know, I've been going through uh, the series on religion with Jordan, and he also informed me there was a problem with one of the links on my website. Thank you. Uh, anyway... <laughs> He, uh, he's telling me about it and he says, you know, you guys started discussing angels and the voice of God and, uh, you know, who, who hears it and why and these different examples. And what I'm wondering is, uh, because Jordan sees that there is a code within the scriptures and that there is a legitimacy to the story being told that there is an entire coded reality to, uh, to all of it, I mean, obviously the the character, the Christ character, re- being represented in the heavens, and many of the other figures in the Bible being represented in the heavens, all of that. But when men are recounting that they have actually had interactions with the voice of God and with angels who have ar- arrived with messages, what does Jordan think of that? Is that part of the coded reality? Is it nothing more than a metaphor? Or is there a mixture of stories to be told here? And that's the uh, the overall question that came together. Well, in this the answer is piece. That, that we are combining apples and oranges and fruits and bananas and everything else. Because everything in the Bible has a different uh, origin. And so when you talk about angels, it has nothing to do with what you think it does. It has something to do with with a phenomena where the spirit world can talk to us. <clears throat> but that spirit world is not necessarily angels. The word angel simply means an, uh, a messenger of El, and El in Hebrew is God. So an angel is a messenger of El or a messenger of God. But if you want to, if you want to hear God and talk about the voice of God, uh, the the Bible in the book of Job says that when you hear God, God talks to us through thunder. So you have to be in an electrical storm and you see lightning and thunder. When it, when you hear the thunder, according to the Bible, that's the voice of God. God is talking to you. And that's what it says in Job 32. I think it's the 32nd chapter. It says God thunders wonderfully with his voice. And he throws down his lightning to the earth, and it's frightening, it's fearful for us to see. And it's a wonderful phenomenon where he thunders with his voice. So we know that the God of the Old Testament is being patterned off of Zeus, because he was a God of lightning and thunder, and he threw his lightning bolts down to the earth. And they said in the ancient world, in mythology, that Zeus thundered with his voice. So you'd have to wait till there's a storm before God's going to talk to you. And so, I don't know if you know that or not, but the old God of the Bible, as far back as the book of Job, was actually the God Zeus. Mm -hmm. The God Zeus thundered with his voice and threw his lightning down to the earth. That's what the scripture says. Right, and we, we've had to spend quite a bit of time on Zeus and uh, the, the Greek and the Roman pantheons because, guess what, uh, they're not separate mystical stories. Uh, this has all been integrated into the scriptures. Now, to hear your voice tonight, by the way, if you're listening live, uh, you can call in. I've actually set up the experimental phone line again tonight, uh, and, and I let a few people know about it. So if you wanted to call in, because a lot of people have said, I'd love to call in when Jordan's on. Uh, Jordan is willing to field phone calls. Now, if you call into 319-527-5016, that is 319-527-5016, you'll get put on hold. You'll hear a little greeting message that tells you you're listening to the Ocelli Effect, and then you'll hear the radio show and you'll be on hold. I'll see you on a switchboard and I can bring you into the conversation directly. If that doesn't work for you, you don't have a phone, you don't want to call in, whatever, you can use the chat room at Ocelli.com, ask questions or comments, and I will enter all of this into the conversation as quickly as I can. But once again, the phone number to call in is 319-527-5016. So as we were saying here, uh, to, to, to hear the voice of God, though, uh, uh, to, to get contact, to get a message from God. We see it in the lightning in the heavens, if you will. Okay. But what about the messengers who are delivering messages 
like you said, angels are messengers of El, so they are God. I get, you know, God's messengers. I get that, but there are many instances where there are people that say they actually heard God speak, and they actually received uh, instructions from God uh, various times. I mean, we, we, we could talk about Abraham and uh, uh, allegedly going to slaughter his one son until uh, an animal shows up that God put there. And then he slaughters the animal instead and takes his son down from the mountain, even though he was his most treasured son and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's an interesting story, although um, also not the first place you could have possibly read it would be the Old Testament, by the way. It's actually yeah. a, a story that came from somewhere else, isn't it, Jordan? Yes. Almost all the stories in the Old Testament were taken from far, far more ancient stories around the world that we know where they came from. The flood of Noah's day, that was an ancient story that's gone around the world in all kinds of cultures for thousands of years before it would put, you know, before it would have been put in the Bible. And so, so many of those stories where Moses was a baby, when Moses was born, the mother put him in a little basket and put him in the Nile River, where the same thing was said for a king <clears throat> in the Middle East that said that his mother put him in a little manger or whatever and put him in a, uh, in, a in the river and a wealthy uh, princess picked up the baby and and brought him into the household and that king became a very famous powerful king in the Middle East and so we know that these stories that we read about the Bible characters are all borrowed from earlier writings <clears throat> and so mm. I think it's in, uh, interesting and I think it's very important that when we use terms we know where they come from and understand why we're using those words and terms because so many people are misled because they don't know what the words mean and the religious leaders are depending on that <clears throat> so that you don't ask them any questions that they can't answer. So they they will feel you fill with incredible stories, but if you ask them questions and you're really thinking and have done your homework and start studying the subject of theology and where these ideas have come from, you're going to find that the people who are leading the religious movements around the world do not know where these ideas have come from. They're just regurgitating what they were taught, and they have no idea because it's been so camouflaged, so covered up that you would never, ever suspect where the ideas that you believe have come from and what they really represent. I think that this is probably one of the most interesting parts of religion is what do these stories actually represent? Where where did they come from? And what did they mean in the original story that was borrowed from? <clears throat> and when you start doing that kind of research, checking to see where these ideas were first expressed and what did they mean then, and now see how we're looking at them today and accepting them today, you will see we really need to go back and do our homework. So that's uh, that's what I try and do. I try and get people to think about what they say they believe and tell you the truth. And I know that doing that, sometimes you, you, you can make an enemy. But like the Apostle Paul said in the Scriptures, am I supposed to be your enemy because I tell you the truth? Or have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? And that is, that's exactly what happens. When you tell people things they don't want to hear, you are no longer their friend. They don't want to hear from you again because you are causing them to wake up and they're not interested in waking up. They want to stay where they are and believe what they want and they'll be happy. And so if you come in... I've used this illustration before. If you were sound asleep and you're very, very tired and you're very deeply asleep and someone comes into your bedroom quietly and slips up close to your bed and turns on a 600-watt bulb next to you, it's going to startle you and you're obviously going to move your head away from the light 
and and guard your eyes so the light won't hit your eyes because it's too bright. And that's what happens when you tell people something they don't want to hear. They turn their head. They don't want to hear it. They put their hands up in front of their eyes. They don't want to see it. And why? Because if you're telling them the truth, the truth is is light. Light and truth are the one of the same things in the Bible. <clears throat> so if you're going to tell somebody something, you're going to enlighten them. And most people don't want to be enlightened. They don't care to know. They want to be happy with doing what they're doing. And it's not important to them. It's not really that important. And so they just want to believe what they want to believe. It's not important to know the truth. Unless, of course, when you die, if you're going to come before a creator and be judged, well, that's different. But that's your problem. You'll find out when you when you leave this world what's going to happen to you. But I have always wanted to know the truth because the truth will set you free. And believe me, it's an incredible story about when you start looking into where these ideas that are written in in, uh, in religion, spirituality, in the Bible, and the holy books, where they came from, and what they actually mean, and how they are still being misunderstood today. For thousands of years, we've been misled, and Christianity especially, and Judaism has no, the Juda- Jewish religion today has no idea in this world where the precepts and concepts and belief systems in Judaism actually came from. And I have said before that if you knew where these ideas have come from and what they represented when they first came on the scene thousands of years ago, you would be shocked to know what you are involved in. Mm -hmm. You would be totally shocked to understand what you are involved with. And, and so many of these uh, stories have to do with sex, pornography, violence, bloodshed, murder, incredible dark stuff that's being promoted in religions that we don't even know what the words mean. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> and I've given you some examples, like the Jews today in Jerusalem, they are praying at the Wailing Wall. And if you watch the Jews who are at the Wailing Wall, watch them on on the on the uh, on the television or on YouTube. <clears throat> watch the Jews at the Wailing Wall when they're praying. They're bobbing back and forth, bobbing back and forth, back and forth. Why? Because they're having sex with God. That's what it symbolizes. And so. People, most Jews don't know that, and, and the reason why they're at the Wailing Wall is because they don't know that there, there is not the wall of King Solomon's temple. They think it's King Solomon's temple. It's not King Solomon's temple. It is a Roman temple built by the Romans. Mm-hmm. has nothing to do with God or the Old Testament or the Holy of Holies or none of that King Solomon's temple. King Solomon's Temple, I'm telling you, if you want to know, it can be proven if you just do the research. King Solomon's Temple is the Great Pyramid of Egypt. It's called the Pyramid of the Sun. And Saul, Om, and On, O-N, is the name of the city in in Egypt that the Greeks call Heliopolis, Heliopolis. Heliopolis is Helios, which is a Greek word for the sun, Opolis is a city, so it's called the City of the Sun. The Greeks call that one city Heliopolis, but it was really originally called, if you go to the dictionary, look up the word On, O-N. Hmm. On is the, is the name of the city Heliopolis in the ancient Egyptian. So when you take the three names for the, for the sun god in ancient Middle East, <clears throat> the ancient Egyptian and Middle Eastern area of the world, and you've got King Saul, S-O-L, which is a sun, Saul. Om, in the Hindu, is a god of the sun, the sun god, who gives energy to the earth. And On, O-N, is the city of the sun in Egypt. So it's Saul, Om, On. And therefore, King Solomon, or King Solomon, is the great pyramid of Egypt. Go back and read the Bible, and it will tell you that there is a temple 
in the midst of the land of Egypt and a, and a, and as a temple in the midst of the land of Egypt. And the Bible says God put it there. God put this temple in Egypt between north and south of Egypt. And now we find out that the, that the temple and, and it's a altar at the border and a temple in the middle of Egypt. And so for many years, we were looking at two different ideas, that there would be an altar in the midst of the land of Egypt and a temple at the border. Now we've come to find out that, no, the altar in the middle of the land of Egypt was the, on the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid itself sits exactly in the midst of the land of Egypt or in the middle between the upper and lower Egypt. There were two Egypts in the ancient world. Just like there are two Carolinas, North Carolina, South Carolina, there's North Dakota and South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And so there were two countries, two different Egypts. And so where those two Egypts met is at the Giza Plateau. And where you draw the line between the northern Egypt and southern Egypt is directly cut right through the pyramid we call the Great Pyramid. And so the Great Pyramid is Saul Oman's temple. You need to wake up and get out of your misery and start learning where these ideas have come from. Yeah. And, you, and you've actually you begin, been there too, haven't you? I've been there three times. I was actually blessed in the king's chamber by a Kemite priest. I've been there three different times and spoke in Cairo about mm -hmm. the religion of the ancient Egyptians. And so, you know, speaking of that, here, here's an interesting thing, because the seminal figure in Judaism would be Moses, according to most yes. people, right? I mean, he's the the beginning figure, right? I mean, he's the, 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 the not not necessarily the first figure, but one of the most the uh, key would, yeah. figures, yep. uh, uh, right? So it's an interesting thing, the way the story of Moses begins. Now, I might be a little rusty on my Old Testament, but... Uh, when they are putting to death all of the children, right? Because, yep. uh, you know, un under a certain age, they're putting to death all the children. Now, supposedly, according to some stories, it's because the, the Savior is about to arrive. The, the Mashiach, the, uh, Messiah is going to come. So the, the king doesn't want to challenge to his authority, supposedly, right? This is the way it's told in churches, mm -hmm. anyway, in Christian churches. Um, that Moses was placed in this basket and placed on a body of water and floats down and is picked up by a queen later or uh, some member of the royal a family. A princess, yeah, a princess, royal excuse family me. princess. Right. Uh, later yeah. and all of that, and that's like the beginning of his story. Um, so a, a question kind of comes across here where if you notice that there's a similarity but also a disconnect with one of those, uh, again, <laughs> Greek stories. Because mm -hmm. uh, Perseus is, you know, the rage of the king, right, who uh, later becomes this other figure in, in uh, Greek mythology. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> is, is going to put to death the queen because uh, she has she's giving birth to uh, uh, someone who has been divinely created through through sex with Zeus and herself. Let's be let's be blunt. Uh, and and. The baby is then placed in uh, an ark of sorts, <laughs> right? Uh, yep. Same kind of thing on a body of water. And now in Perseus's case, he's found by a fisherman. And then he becomes a demigod, and there's a whole story there. But it seems like there's bits and pieces that have similarity and then turn away from the original story when it comes to the Greek thing, which means to me that we got to go further back than the Greek to get the original story, and maybe it would be a little more similar to the story of Moses. Is, is there a figure before Perseus that... Uh, well, I'm sure there was a proto-Moses in those ancient stories, uh, but the important thing to keep in mind for today is that Moses, in point of fact, is an Egyptian word. It has nothing to do with Hebrew at all. Okay. Or Jewish at all. It's a it's an Egyptian word, and it simply means something. Moses means something. Uh, it means the son of, and this is why you have in the ancient world you would have your name, and then there would be a a, a middle name, 
which is called Ben in Hebrew, and then your father's last name. So we have people, Jewish uh, princes, who were called Judah Ben-Hur, if you remember that. Uh-huh. Judah Ben-Hur. Ben is, is the son of. So when you say Judah Ben-Hur, Judah would have been the man's name, and he was the son of his father, whose name was Hur, H-U-R. So he became known as Judah Ben-Hur. And so Ben in Hebrew means the son of. Well, in Egyptian, Moses means the son of. And so Moses, as an actual person, never really lived. There was no such a man as Moses. But Moses, we know now, scientifically we know, that Moses was a leader of a lunar cult. Moses was a God that was named in relation to a moon cult, moon worshipers. And today, we still have Moses as an important leader of the Hebrew people who have all their holy days and count their days and their and their calendar from sundown to sundown, from six in the evening to six in the next evening is the Hebrew day. Why? Because that's when this moon comes out is at sundown. And so you would not have, and so Christians, we have our solo, you know, our days of, of holy days during the daytime when the sun is out because we're worshiping God's sun, the light of the world, <clears throat> as a risen Savior. And of course, the sun is your Savior. And so if the sun doesn't come up, we're all dead. So obviously the sun is your savior, and that's why we have Christians worshiping when, during the day. Right. But the Jews have their holy days after sundown because that's when the moon comes out. It comes out after 6 o'clock, so therefore they start their day with the coming of their God each each day, and he comes out from the from the heavens. He comes out. And now he will preside over the earth for 12 hours, the moon. And so the moon was a, was considered a deity by the ancient Hebrews. And today they'll still tell you, today, Jews will tell you today, that their calendar is referred to as a lunar calendar. Right. Christians have a solar calendar. <clears throat> so today Judaism is really a, a continual um smorgasbord of religious beliefs and it's just uh the more you look at it if you're intellectually honest and look at every single belief system in judaism and take the time to trace it back each one it will take you years to do that you will begin to see where all the ideas in judaism have come from and one of the most important gods today in Judaism at one time was the moon. It's still there. They still have remnants of the moon worship. But today, the main uh, god in Judaism is the planet Saturn. Saturn is Lord of the Rings. Mm. And that's why you have the Jews in Hollywood making movies about their god, Lord of the Rings. Because Lord of the Rings is the planet Saturn, and Saturn is the god of the Hebrews today. The Jews on the earth today worship Saturn. Saturn is the Lord of the Rings. Hmm. You know, it was fascinating, <clears throat> so, Jordan, when I lived in a uh, in an Orthodox Jewish community that was uh, almost uh, it was slowly becoming dominant. The the Orthodox Jewish community uh, within this certain area that I lived, uh, but it was like a half a split kind of thing where half of the community was Orthodox uh, uh, Jewish. Um, exactly as you describe on Friday night, okay, when, when the sun set on Friday night, that was it. Uh, you, you did not see any of those guys or their families out doing anything really. Uh, you didn't see, uh, they, they, they wouldn't go to any of the local stores cause they weren't allowed to handle money. Um, <clears throat> anything that they had cooked or whatever, uh, to my understanding, yeah, whatever they were going to eat for the next day had to already be prepared and sitting there. Um, and on occasion, when something would go wrong and they required, like they weren't supposed to work, handle money, nothing. It was their time of rest, and it was between the two uh, the, the the two sunsets. So it would start yes. at night, and then it would not end until the next night began. 
basically. That's right. Uh, That's and, it. and this started on Fridays and went into mm-hmm. Saturday. Uh, right. Which they is went really, into yeah. Saturn's day. Exactly. That 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 was what I was going to ask you about. Is is, is this something that uh, we we can see in an earlier lunar cult? Uh, that's one question. The other question is, there are different tribes. <laughs> they call them uh, within within Judaism. Um, where you have uh, uh, Levites, let's just say, and they're supposed to be those who take after uh, Levi, who is uh, among the first of the children that, you know, each one of them will become a tribe and all of that. Um, do we see a difference between them in that, you know, there's cantors and all that kind of stuff, but is there a difference between the different cults of the moon that still exist between them, like within these... So well, first of all, yeah, go ahead. first of all, though there is in fact no ten tribes of Israel exists. That's just a story. It's an it's an ancient fable, mm-hmm. not based on actual history at all. So when you hear people talking about the ten tribes of Israel, the lost ten tribes of Israel, there was no ten tribes of Israel. It never happened. There was no ancient Israel. Period. There was no ancient Israel, period. Therefore, there was no ancient ten tribes of Israel. And so the twelve brothers of Joseph are the twelve signs of the zodiac. The twelve stones and the breastplate of the high priest was symbols for the zodiac, the twelve signs of the zodiac. And so the zodiac plays a very big part in Judaism and Christianity. And so that can be traced back, that can be traced back in, in Christianity and, and Judaism to Hinduism. The Hindus are the ones that were promoting this idea of uh, the symbols of the zodiac. And there were 12 tribes of Israel. No, there wasn't. There were 12 signs of the zodiac. There was no 12 tribes of Israel. Israel did not exist supposedly as Jacob, and they called him Israel. <clears throat> and so it's a, it's, a, it's a really difficult story to try and explain without pictures and have somebody for two or three hours just show you the pictures and the documents and trace it backwards so that you can see where the ideas have developed and where they came from and how we humans are, are ignorant and ill-informed and unread, and we have not studied the, the, the world of theology in the ancient world, and therefore we're just being told something by people who, are, who got their degree from a university so they could teach us what we're supposed to know. But remember, when the rabbis get their degree so they can, they can teach you, like the Catholic priests and all the other, uh, clergy in the in the churches, they all have to go to a seminary, a cemetery, a seminary, and uh, and some of the rabbis call it a, a cemetery. <clears throat> but you have to go and get a degree before you can become a rabbi. Why? Because you must get Caesar, emperor of the Roman Empire, to put his imprimatur on you. You have to have him stamp your name and his, put his stamp and seal on your name and your diploma. So that gives you an opportunity now to be a rabbi. You, you've got the imprimatur of Caesar stamped on you. And therefore, the way you do that is you go to college and study. And the university will teach you what you need to tell the people. And so when you get out, that's all you know is what you've been told. And never realize that you've been told something that's not true. But it's based on the bumbling and imbecilic stuff going back thousands of years ago that people misunderstood and mistranslated. And they gave it to you in college. And now you can teach everybody else until somebody comes along and starts questioning where you got these ideas from. That's what I do. And I'll tell you, when you do that, it becomes very obvious that all the different things that are taught in the churches and religion have nothing to do with what you thought they did. Nothing. 
most most of the stories in all religions, including Protestant Christianity, the Baptists and Presbyterians and, and Episcopal and all of the Protestant religions are preaching ideas and, and philosophies and, and ideas and concepts and words which has to do with perverted sex. It has to do with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's an incredible story about what religion has done to the human family. Mm. And, and you would never suspect when you, when you're being told these stories, you would never be able to figure out where they came from unless somebody taught you and showed you where it came from in the ancient world and what these ideas actually mean. Then, for the first time, you will begin to see what you've gotten yourself involved in, something that was totally over your head, just like in a courtroom. You have to have a lawyer speak for you because you don't know what the words mean in a court of law. It's called legalese, not English, legalese. Mm -hmm. You have to know when a judge is saying something, the words he's using, and the words that the attorney is using, you can't use those words. You need to shut up and let the attorney speak. He's your mouthpiece. Why? Because he's been taught in university what to say and how to say it. If you say something you think you're answering a question, you can go to jail. Nobody asks you. And so that's the same thing in religion. This is why you have judges who, when they walk out, uh, the, the bail says all people rise, everyone rises. And then when the judge sits down, everyone can sit down. And the same thing when a Catholic priest or a bishop or any of the high officials in the Christian church come out, everybody rises. And when he's, and when he is ready to officiate over the mass, everyone sits down. It's the same idea. There are three steps high on all the altars always have three steps to, to go up the step to go onto the altar. That's the first three degrees of Freemasonry. It goes back to ancient secret societies and occult orders. And we're not being told anything about where these ideas have come from. And again, I'm just telling you to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that's what I'm trying to do <clears throat> on my website, is to bring up all the points that have not been explained and tell you where they come from and why, why you believe what you do and what it all means to you. So that's what we do. That's what I do. Right. No, and you and you have absolutely uh, uh, been at the forefront of it for a long time. Uh, you know, it, it's it's funny. I was discussing with somebody earlier this week that uh, a lot of the ideas that uh, that that people hear out there um, were first heard from you, really, <laughs> and in one way or another have been echoed and repeated. Some people have learned, and some people have stolen stuff from you. Uh, but, uh, but, but they're out there doing it one way or another. I mean, um, I, I don't support theft from you, obviously, but some of the people who have, uh, uh, gone on and learned from those who have stolen from you have still learned the, the, you know, something of value, which is, which is interesting. It's like no matter what they do with this and no matter how they try to corrupt it, uh, the work that you're doing, uh, has, has a life of its own. And, uh, yes. so that, that's something to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah, I have been doing, I've been talking about this idea of understanding the hidden words and terms and the hidden symbols and what they actually, in fact, mean and where they've come from. I've been doing this since 1959, which is actually 59 years ago. Next year, it will be 60 years I've been out talking to audiences and trying to educate people on radio and speaking at conferences around the world, trying to explain to them, mm -hmm. wake up and understand that you do not know where things have come from. Your government hasn't told you. Your religions haven't told you. Always question authority, because the word authority comes from the word author. And so question, who is the author of this work? Whatever it is you're telling me, who first wrote it? Where does the author come from? Mm -hmm. You know, and so you say, well, here's the law. The law says this and the law says that. I quickly say, who wrote this law? Was it an Englishman that wrote the law? Was it Arabic? Who wrote this law? Who was it? What was his name? 
and tell me about this person that wrote the law. And how, how great was he in life? And then you begin to see that, no, we're all just students. We all learn from each other. And so we go to college, we go to university, we get our degree, and that means you it's a work order. You can now go to work. You can now get a job. It's a job uh, work order that you can get <clears throat> so that you can now become a minister and a priest or a rabbi, or, or whatever the religious order you're in. And it all goes back to something that Jesus said. In the, in the New Testament, uh, the Bible says, Jesus said, you have formed for yourselves teachers, and the, and the blind leading the blind shall fall both into the pit. Why? Because you have formed for yourselves teachers. What he was saying, what that means is that the way religions work today is they regurgitate the old stories that they were told when they were little kids and their grandfathers were told when their grandfathers were little kids and their great-grandfather was told when he was a little kid. So everybody is telling the same story to their youth and so today you come in and your grandfather and your older and the elders in the, in the, in your culture, they tell you certain things and you have to understand and, and go along with it. And then you can get a job. You can be a part of the community. But if you're going to question, if you're going to question the authority of the people and find out where does this actually come from and what does it really mean? then you're going to be outcast. And the Bible has Jesus saying, what they've done to me, they will do to you. If they had listened to me, then they would listen to you. The people don't want to hear the truth. Mm. They're happy just believing whatever they've been taught all their life, and they're happy to be there, and that's all they want. They don't care to know the real truth of who we are and where we are and where we're going. Mm. <clears throat> but something's going to happen one day soon, and when it does... The people of this world are going to be forced to wake up and find out they have been lied to from day one. And they never knew and they never saw it coming. And so now we're seeing organizations like Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, watching some of that stuff on, on the, on the web, where the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses is quite literally now falling apart, collapsing. They're telling everybody at the, at the headquarters in New York, uh, at the headquarters of New York, they're telling the officials and the Watchtower Society that runs the Jehovah's Witnesses organization, they're telling the people that are there working for them to just go home. Just go home. Go back, go back to where you came from. <clears throat> no more, there's no more games. We're not, we're not making any money. It's all falling apart. People are now questioning everything. And we've told so many lies and misunderstanding and, and, and perverted the whole story for so long that now it's falling apart. And the same thing is happening with the Vatican, with the Catholic Church. It's falling apart because now we're beginning to see what it's really all about. And, and now <clears throat> with all the other religions, we're beginning to see all the other religions of the West falling apart. Why? Because they have been teaching lies and deception, and it's all not working now. The people are no longer listening. They are right. looking for truth. Right, and I know you're not big on talking about current events, but but we need to enter this into the conversation. Because recently, uh, there, there were these statements being made by, uh, by Pope Francis regarding the uh, you know, the, the sex scandals in quotes I hold up right now for those of you at home, uh, you know, regarding this and, uh, they, they, they were going to get together and discuss it. But he said right up front that, uh, that effectively, uh, the statement seemed to indicate, you know, look, not much is going to get done here. I, I mean, it was really bizarre to hear the Pope basically say, yeah, we're aware of the sex scandals and we want to do something about it, but, it, we're, we're not going to be able to even when we get together and have these conclaves, these discussions uh, about yeah. it. Did you see that news story? Yeah, absolutely. And I also remember about a year ago, a little over a year ago, <clears throat> there was a big meeting, a big council meeting at the Vatican. And some of the highest uh, teachers at the Vatican, the, the scholars, 
at the Vatican, they said that the the uh, the word in the press was, was, Vatican says Jesus may not be coming back at all. Maybe we miscalculated. We miscalculated, and I don't think he's going to be coming back to this world at all. That's what the Vatican said. Go back and look for it on the web. The Vatican officials said that Jesus may not be coming back. We've made a mistake. And so I'm saying, yeah, you made a big mistake because all the millions of people who lived their lives believing in something that's not true are now going to have to face the, the music of waking up and finding out all that you've been taught was not true, period. It was a foolish story that you bought into and never asked the question, where did this stuff come from? Well, speaking so of that, I, there, there's a question here, actually, from a listener. Uh, it's a text question, but uh, it asks about the practices of the Catholic Church and uh, asks a question I do not know the answer to, um, which is the use of candles in the Catholic Church seems to not make much. This is from Linda. Seems to not make much sense. Uh, why is it that there are candles and the whole procession with the altar boys uh, before Catholic services, uh, then she also asks about uh, about about something else, which is the you know the stand, sit, kneel, pray. The uh, I, I I used to jokingly call it the Catholic aerobic um, you know portion of the service, yeah. and uh, that goes on too. <clears throat> but uh, but really, what her main question was about the candles. Do you know what what that is about? Why it is the Catholics <laughs> utilize these candles and uh, actually incense, they come by with incense that burns that they go down the aisle these with. Are and... all, these are all candles, incense, and hymns, and the holy atmosphere of something which is very holy has been known for a thousand years, that it captures the imagination and the hearts of the people in the church. It all sounds and looks very holy and very religious and Everybody goes along to get along. Nobody knows what it means. Nobody seems to be aware that candles used to rep a male phallic. It used to be the male erection, candles. It goes back to that. That's why at the top of the candle was a, was a metal tip, and the tip was on fire. And this was why it gets into sex, sex rituals. The candles were used to represent the male phallic. Uh, as, you know, and now we don't need to go into that because now we know the Catholic Church is filled with that kind of stuff. And the, we've been told about these things. And, and a lot of people who have studied theology, they understand where all these ideas have come from. But most people have never heard any of this. And they're just quietly going along to get along because we don't want to do anything that would be against our friends. Because all of our friends who work with us every day and live with us and all of our neighbors and friends, they go to church and they believe this and they believe that. Well, if I'm a Jew, then I have to believe that in order to be accepted by my Jewish friends and my Jewish family. Well, in point of fact, no, I say different. No, I want to know for sure. Show me where something has come from and explain it to me intellectually superior so that I can understand what I'm doing when I go to a church. And where did you get the word church from? That's an incredible story, too, when you find out where the word church comes from. And, and most people have no idea where these ideas and belief systems, what they mean and where they come from. <clears throat> so that's what I do. I try and cause people to think. And uh, oh, years ago in Europe, you would have been hung or burned at the stake for causing people to think and question authority. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I do. I question authority because it comes, the word authority comes from the word author. And I want to know who authored this stuff. Who wrote this down to start with? Where did it come from? We're told, we're told that Moses, when he was, he was, uh, representing, uh, his people to God, he went up into the holy mountain, and the mountain was called, it was called the mountain of sin, S-I-N. Look it up in a dictionary. Mm -hmm. Go to a cyclopedia, look up the word S-I-N, and, and you will find that the word sin is not 
is not doing something wrong, like the Catholic Church says. No, sin is the name of the moon god. Today he is referred to as Allah. But Allah is actually an original name going back thousands of years. His name was Sin, S-I-N, was a moon god. And he lived in a mountain. And, of course, at 6 o'clock in the evening, you would see the moon rising on the horizon, coming from the east. If you were in the west, you're watching it come from the east. It rises within the mountains. There's a mountain range in the Sinai, and the moon comes up from the mountain. And so the ancient peoples in Egypt, they believed that the moon lived inside the mountain. And at 6 o'clock, he comes out to oh, to dominate the world. So if you're following the moon and moon worshiper, then he is your god, and, he is names, and his name is Sin. And Ai was a mountain. And so you put the mountain and the moon god of the mountain, which was Sin and Ai. It becomes Mount Sinai. No, Mount Sinai is not holy. It's the mountain of the moon god whose name is Sin. Sin, A-I, the god of the mountain, the moon god, mm-hmm. comes out at 6 o'clock. That's why Mount Sinai is so important to the Jewish religion. The Jews do not know, like they don't know about the Wailing Wall. They don't know about Solomon's Temple. They don't know a lot about Judaism. Because nobody is bothering to tell anybody. The handful of rabbis that may know, they're not going to tell you nothing. That I've been told by rabbis, we're not about to talk to the Jewish people and tell them what the real story is. We have to, we got to have a job too, and everybody has a religion. I was told, told that many years ago by a very prominent rabbi. He said, look at, give me a break. Everybody has a religion. Catholics got a religion. The Protestants got religions. Buddhists, everybody's got a religion. Well, give me a break. I'm a Jew, and I have to have a religion. So I got, I got a religion. And so I asked him, well, <clears throat> when you look at the different religions, you have Christianity, which has Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Why do you have three divine persons in one God? It's because you're talking about the Son. The Son, when it comes up in the morning, is newborn. When it hits 12 noon, it's the most high God because they don't get any higher than high noon. So it's the most high, and then at night it is leaving the world, and it's going to leave this world in the hands of the prince of darkness. The prince of darkness in the ancient world, in the ancient Egyptian world, was called Set because they got they noticed it got dark at sunset. Mm-hmm. And so today we still keep the same terms, sunset, And God's son is born in the morning. He's born in the morning. He grows to full growth at 12 noon. And now at 12, he's he's educating everybody on the earth. Because if you can't learn anything at noon, you're never going to see it at all. And so that's why today you have three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Three religions. And in, in the ancient world, you had in Egypt was Osiris, Isis, Horus. And in, and in uh, Catholicism, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Hindu, it's Brahma, Sh- Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, always three gods in one. Right. And so it goes all the way back to, and then, of course, the Jews have to have a religion. So they got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right. a triune Godhead, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then you find out there was no Abraham. Abraham never lived. There was no man named Abraham. Wake up and understand you've been had. You've been believing something that wasn't true. And you've never done the research to find out if it was true. So now wake up and realize there was no Abraham. Abraham goes back to, in the Bible, his name was not Abraham originally. It was called Abram, A-B-R-A-M. A-B was father, and R-A-M is a ram. Abram, Abram becomes Abraham later. But originally we confront in the Old Testament, Abraham was Abram. A-B-R-A-M. A-B is father and Ram is a ram. Mm. And so when you begin to see how that plays into Abraham and then you go into India and you will see that there was a, 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 a priesthood in India that still exists today. 
<clears throat> and they are known as God's chosen people. In India, the term was God's chosen people was the priesthood of Abraham. Abraham, or what is called Abram or Abraham, was God's chosen people. But those priests were called uh, the followers of, uh, of uh, well, my mind is so filled with this stuff, I can't even remember the words. Are you talking about but what Abraham, they commonly call the Brahmin? The Brahmins, correct. Yeah. The Brahmins. The Brahmin priesthood were God's chosen people. And they were told, the Brahmin, part of the Brahmin religion, uh, if you were a Brahmin priest, you were told don't have anything to do with the ordinary common people in the street. Stay way away from them. They're untouchable. Don't touch them. Don't have anything to do with them. Mm. Why? Because they're beneath us. We are very highly intelligent, spiritual people. We are the workers of God. And these people in the street, they're not worth two cents, the whole bunch of them. So leave them alone. They're untouchable. And so today we still have those ideas about the priest in Israel and people of Israel telling you that they are God's chosen people, just like the Brahmins. And the reason why is because their father was Abraham, no, a Brahmin. Mm. And so a Brahmin gives us today Abraham. Right. No, and and, and uh, the, the, this is all the the linkage that one needs to see to understand where these things originally come from. Now, there's a couple of questions that arise here, and we're probably going to get into them in the next hour, but I think we're going to take a break coming here. Why? Because it's too big of a subject to get into. You know, we talked about these three major religions, right? They yep. do seem to be strategically placed against one another, Mm -hmm. uh, all the time. And that's, you know, from the Crusades to uh, the various, uh, you know, alleged and real uh, attacks on, on look, in general on the Jews. Of course, this was a big story this week because there was a, um, a you know, two mosques in New Zealand that were attacked. And people talked about this, this uh, you know, war and this interaction between the religions and identity and all this stuff. It's very strange because I was always taught, and, and I know that I have to be untaught many things that I've been taught, but one of those things happened to be that uh, these were all the Abrahamic religions. These all came from the same place. There should be a, a kinship, if you will, That's between... Right. Uh, Islam and Judaism and Christianity. But that's not the way it plays out. And so in the next hour, I want to get your thoughts on that. But I'd also like to uh, uh, get your thoughts on a question which comes in from a listener regarding the cross itself. Uh, because uh, they argue that the, this is a symbol which existed before uh, Christianity. And, and I know the argument well. And I'm sure you know what we're talking about here. But uh, but I think that both of these things need to be gotten into in the next hour. I want to talk first about uh, the the struggle, if you will, between the three alleged Abrahamic religions that uh, that seems to be constantly stoked by governments and everything else <laughs> at all times. You know, it's it's a it's a, a, a battle of cultures, a clash of civilizations, even. Yep, uh, you're right. You know, and and it's just. It's weird because if you believe what it is they teach you on the surface, you would think, again, these would be natural allies, but not necessarily so. so Jordan Maxwell is with me now here at Ocelli.com. Of course, when I'm off air, everybody who's a guest on this show gets to hear me cough just before I open up the microphone, but you don't. So that's a treat, right? <laughs> anyway, it is a Monday. I always say something odd at the beginning of the second hour. I know. Uh, I guess it's just a force of habit, but something that uh, is also becoming quite a bit of a habit here is that we've continued on with this discussion with Jordan Maxwell regarding <laughs> religion. And, you know, quite honestly, between your questions, my questions and the story itself, the fact that we'll have 40 hours in the can by the time this is done still doesn't mean it's done, um, just so you know. And if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, that is the only website, site, whoa, website, okay, website that is Jordan Maxwell's, jordanmaxwellshow.com. you got to put it all together. 
The Research Society is over there. Contact form. You can make a donation. I will discuss this a little more later in the hour. And if you want to join into the show and you're listening live, and only if you're listening live, obviously if it's a podcast, I'm going to annoy you for about 15 seconds because I'm going to tell you that the call-in number is 319-527-5016. That's 319-527-5016. You guys ask me why is it I can't call in when Jordan Maxwell's on? Well, now you can. 319-527-5016, and you'll hear a greeting that lets you know that you're like tuned into Ocelli.com, and then you'll actually hear the show while you're on hold, and I'll be able to bring you directly into the conversation. Of course, if you're at the chat room at Ocelli.com right now, you can also enter a question in there. If you put a capital Q in front of it, it'll call my attention to it quicker, but I, I often scan the chat room to uh, enter your comments and questions into discussion. So all of that being true, Jordan, uh, as I stated at the end of the last hour, um, let's, let's begin, let's begin with the big bad issue here. Okay. Which is the thing that is going to be in the news, has been in the news, is in the news today, <coughs> always, and is, is part of the, dis- the discussion about religion, even if people aren't trying to open their eyes, if they're just talking about it in a mainstream sense. Let's talk about the clash of civilizations, the war between religious ideologies and who the extremists are and who the fundamentalists are and all that. You know, it, again, I was always taught, I realize again that this is going to sound silly, but I was always taught that Islam, Judaism, and Christianity all were what they called the Abrahamic religions. We talked about Abraham, but let's talk about the religions. They seem to be natural allies of one another, according to the mainstream story. I mean, maybe a little different. Maybe there is a cultural difference. There's a different regional geographical problems that cause it to do this, that, the third thing. But that's not the thing that's going on. It seems like at all times it's useful to pit Christians against Muslims because Christians are afraid of Muslims. Muslims are there to kill Christians because they're the infidels, you know, calling back to the Crusades. And then again, there was the Spanish Inquisitions. And, well, not just the Spanish Inquisition. There was actually an Inquisition in various countries. Don't believe me? Check your history. Uh, the thing is, there, there were Inquisitions where they wanted to convert Jews to Christianity. Okay, fine, but... There's these clashes, these wars, these interactions. There are Palestinians under siege in the allegedly holy land. But like you said, a lot of holes in the story about the holy land, and we need to learn about that. But let me just ask you in general what your thoughts are about how it seems like there is a constant effort and there is a design here at play that keeps these three religions... Um, constantly trading shots and in conflict with one another. Is, is that, uh, just my imagination or what? No, no, I think that these, all three major religions are first of all corporations. They are considered to be companies, just like General Electric and General Motors and Ford Motor Company. Well, Islam is considered to be a corporation. It's a company. And Christianity is a corporation. It's incorporated under the Vatican canon law. And, uh, and regular Protestant Christianity is a corporation. It's all a company. It's all companies, corporations. It's business. And so the way to keep business, uh, going and, and getting hotter is to cause friction. <clears throat> because that always brings out the best in people for, for commerce is that there's a war going on. Commerce makes war, and war is good business. And so I think that's the reason why you have the three divine religions that's based on a fourth one. All three of our major religions of this world are based on Hindu. Hindu religion gives us Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And when you start doing the homework on Islam, you will see that Islam, like Christianity and Judaism, have have brought into their religion all of the ancient Greek gods from Zeus and all those concepts of the ancient gods and what they could do and what they did and how they ruled the world and the ancient Greek pantheon. It's all in Islam. And 
And then just to tell somebody, like Adolf Hitler said, that if you tell a lie long enough and big enough, eventually it will be believed. And so <clears throat> Islam has been told for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years, it's been told to the Middle East Arabic population that oh, that uh, Muhammad was the last great prophet of God. God's greatest prophet was Muhammad. And you keep telling those people that, and one day they'll actually believe it. And then before you know it, now you've got people riled up about Muhammad being the the last great prophet of God. And where did you get that? Well, somebody dreamt that one up a long time ago, and I think it was the Jesuits. Myself, I think the Jesuits gave us today what we call um, the Muhammad religion, the Islamic religion, I believe, is orchestrated by the Jesuits. And today, the, the Pope of Rome is a Jesuit. Mm. And that's what the Jesuits have been trying to do for hundreds of years, is to get inside the Vatican. Well, now they've got inside the Vatican, and now they've got one of their own Jesuits to become the Pope. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of politics and lies and deception and assassinations and murder and sex and bribery all kinds of stuff goes on in the high halls of international power. And that's what's going on today in Rome. <clears throat> and don't forget that the Holy Father is the Holy Father. We call him a Holy Father because he's a Papa. He's our Father. And the Papa means a door. And so your Papa is a door. He's a door to life for you. And so and for him, for Papa to be a door, he needs to have hinges to open the door. And a hinge in Latin is a cardinal. That's why the Pope has cardinals, ah. because they, it's like having the cardinal point of a zodiac, a cardinal point on a map is a cardinal city. The word cardinal means a hinge, something where you start and go out from is a cardinal point. And so the Pope has the cardinals who are helping him deliver the message of the ancient gods which was Dagon, the Pope represents Dagon, not Jesus. Right. Jesus has nothing to do with the Catholic Church. Uh, the God that is being worshipped and promoted by the Vatican, look it up in the dictionary, do something you've never done before, just go to a dictionary and read about a God named D-A-G-O-N, Dagon. Dagon, the fish god. And you will see that the Catholic Church is promoting the worship of an ancient Phoenician Canaanite fish god called Dagon. And when you see the Pope wearing a, a strange headdress, that's a fish head. It's the symbol for the fish that came out of the sea, out of the waters of the earth, and <clears throat> and his name was Dagon, the fish god. Mm. And when you start breaking down these stories... The classic example of the things I'm talking about that I'm telling you were absolutely outrageous, but we don't know what they mean, so therefore it's not that big a deal because nobody knows what it means anyway, so therefore nobody's offended. But when you read about Moses went up into the mountain and it, the mountain was on fire, and the scripture says that God was in the mountain, and the way that the ancient ancient uh, Israelites knew that God was in the mountain is because He always uh, He always expressed Himself. God always showed Himself to the Jewish people <clears throat> as a fire by day and a pillar by night, and that's what the scripture says. It was a fire by day in the mountain. That holy mountain was a fire by day and a pillar of cloud by by daytime, pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. Mm. And so what what kind of a mountain is that? It has a pillar of fire at night and a huge pillar of smoke by day if it isn't a volcano. Right. And volcanoes were always connected to, in the Middle East, volcanoes were connected to feminine sex. This A volcano always represented feminine sex. The ejaculation of a female is, is, was symbolized by a volcano. The volcano was always given a female name. And this is why when Moses goes up into the mountain, he confronts God. And where does he see God? He sees him at a burning bush. The burning bush 
I've seen pictures from Jewish magazines and articles that I've collected over the years. The burning bush shows a female sitting there with her legs somewhat open, and, and, and Moses is now confronting God. Yeah, well, that's what you do as a male. You're confronting God with sex. And so the burning bush is a female, is a female her burning bush. And so it sounds so holy that Moses confronts God at the Holy of Holies in Mount Sinai, and God was in the burning bush. No, a burning bush is a female, female sexual symbol. Mm-hmm. And this is why volcanoes today are given female names, feminine names. Right. It's and, quite a story. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we've been over how the, this ties to uh, really more more primitive worship of the volcano itself, uh, of the actions of it. You know, you have the gods of the volcanoes, I mean, uh, where they would throw people into the volcano to try and satisfy it so that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it wouldn't uh, lash out at the village below and, and bury everybody in uh, molten lava, you know. <laughs> Uh, yep, th- you're right. th- this kind of thing. But <clears throat> here's what's interesting uh, with the first part of what you were talking about. And, and I think this would do people some good. Uh, y- you mentioned the Jesuits. Yep. Now, I think there is a good amount of people who have heard it mentioned, have read about them maybe, and don't necessarily understand who they are, uh, first of all. Now, what's interesting here is that it makes total sense to me that the Jesuit order would create something that would be uh, exactly the opposite to what really Arab culture has built into it to begin with. And and uh, probably a lot of listeners are going, what is he talking about? Well, let me explain something. In, in Arab culture, forget about religion, okay? In Arab culture, uh, the idea that you uh, would take a wayward stranger into your home and they are there to protect you, even the story, by the way, in the Bible – uh, of, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to get, you know, send out these, uh, these, these angels that came to the city in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Yeah. Uh, send them out to us. We're, we're gonna, well, they had to protect them. Why? Uh, not because they were trying to satisfy God, but because quite honestly in the Middle East, um, if someone comes into your home, you protect them. They are your guest. You take care of them. That's right. That's a cultural reality that existed before any of these religions. Um, and it probably had a practical sense to it, because if you were to venture out from your own encampments, let's say, uh, you, you'd want the guarantee that your people would be okay wherever they went, and therefore you would guarantee the safety of others. It was probably very practically developed. Uh, these are my guesses, Jordan, but uh, again, it's kind of hard to trace these things. But it yeah, seems but to me like is, the it's, Jesuits it's bad for business. It's uh, bad see, for business. There it is. See, the Jesuits would create something though that would fly in the face of that, <laughs> and then give it to those very same people because it's much better for business to have the uh, uh, desire to protect yourself from anyone who uh, you know encounters your area, right? Who comes in because if you have people battling with one another then eventually uh, you can take this to grievances and to courts of sorts, which were also seemingly developed by these same people. But I think it would be useful to explain to people, in short, uh, you know, who the Jesuits are and where they came from and uh, what, what it is their purpose is because, well, you know, to a lot of people that might just seem like, well, that's just one of those orders of priests. Why are they any different from... You know, we don't know the names of of the others, but the rest of them. Why are they different exactly? Well, I I think I've used this excuse before. Suppose I, as a white man, were in Africa and I got in trouble and they threw me in prison. And all around me are blacks in the prison and I'm the only white guy. And so logic alone would tell you that I need to do some thinking real quick because I've got masses of blacks in, in, the, in the prison, and I'm the only white guy. <clears throat> and so the smart thing to do is for the white guy to start spreading rumors among the rest of the uh, rest of the uh, inmates about what other people, what the other inmates are saying about you and about your mother and about your family. 
and I go to one group and I tell them, uh, you know what this, those, those guys over in that corner over there, what they said about you and your mother? And then they, now I've got them mad at each other and they're going to be struggling against each other and, and then I go and do that over and over and over until I finally got the whole prison rant and raving at each other. And I'm passing around rumors and causing, uh, causing, uh, you know, problems for the whole, uh, prison. And I'm getting everybody mad at each other and fighting each other by lying to them. So thank God they're all killing each other and they leave me alone. Ah. And so that's the smart thing to do is get everybody fighting each other and then they'll leave you alone. And so the Jesuits were found in the mid 1500s. And I believe that the Jesuits are responsible for founding so many of the major religions today. So many of these religions have been founded by Jesuits. Uh, of that, I mean, uh, the Masonic order is a Jesuit Catholic Jesuit order that was founded. We call it today Freemasonry. I think it has a Jesuit foundation. The Catholic Church Jesuits founded what we call the Freemasonic Lodge. I am sure that the Jesuits founded Freemasonry, and I'm sure that Freemasonry, in the hands of the Jesuits, helped finance and organize and direct Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Christadelphians, Worldwide Church of God, and all of the other British Israel World Federation religions. Go back and look at the British Israel World Federation concept, and you will see that Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, Worldwide Church of God, Christadelphians, so many different cults of Christianity in America are actually Masonic cults and founded by Freemasons, and financed by Freemasons, and run by Freemasons, and Freemasonry itself is run by the Jesuits. And so I think that there's been a continual <clears throat> feeding of poison into the human society, causing people to hate each other, causing people to be racist against each other, and never realizing that it's so that you will not look at your real enemy. The real enemy is the one that's right there in your midst and doing all this to you so that you will become so weak and so downtrodden that you will not be any, uh, you won't be any competition to the enemy that's already inside your gates. And by enemy inside the gates of America, I mean the one group that the founding fathers back in 1700s when they founded the United States of America as a republic, not a democracy, they founded the United States as a republic, <clears throat> they said there were two things that the founding fathers did not want in this country, and it's written that way. The two groups that they did, want, did not want coming into this country were lawyers and the Catholic Church, the Vatican. The Vatican was not allowed to operate on the on the property we call the United States of America. Well, <clears throat> when people were going west, you know, back in the 1700s, 1800s, when mankind was leaving the East Coast and going west, uh, the you can ask any military guy, what does the word mission mean? As a mission is a military term for a, a military operation. It's called a mission. That's a military term. Well, that's why California and the west of the United States has mission. They have Catholic missions. Mission is a military term. The mission was set up by the Jesuits. And so they were, they were coming into this country the back way. The, uh, the, the, the corporation called the United States did not want the Catholic Church here in America at all. They specifically stated that. But the Jesuits, they went across the country, and how they did it, they came through Mexico, they came through Canada, and slipped into the country and founded what they call missions, Catholic missions. And so it was a military establishment of the Catholic Church, a Roman Church, and inserting itself into the United States of America with missions. And so that's why today... The Jesuits are a military order within the Catholic Church. 
And, you know, you hear people say, well, the Pope doesn't have any troops. Well, what can he do? He, he has no troops. America's got the troops. European leaders have got the troops. What does the Pope have? He just got a bunch of priests. No, he doesn't. He has the very most incredibly brilliant theoretical physicists in the world. They're called Jesuits. They know exactly how to play your number. They know exactly how to get you to hate somebody else and start a war. They know precisely how to run the world with chaos because out of chaos comes control. It's called ordo ab chaos, order out of chaos. And so this is why I am sure that the Jesuits are behind all of the stuff going on in Europe right now because the Europeans are involved in, the, in reestablishing the Nazi party today in, in Europe. It's called the Euro. It's actually a Nazi idea provided for by and directed by Jesuits. And the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church is trying to reestablish the rule of the Roman Empire over the whole earth, and they're calling it the New World Order. It's an incredible story of betrayal, and so many people see the Catholic Church and have no idea in the world what this thing is really all about, where this Christianity actually came from, what it teaches and all the sexual symbolism and violence and wars and bloodshed, all of this stuff is being fed to the human race, and this is why we're in trouble today, because our people, like the Bible says, God says to his people, my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. And there's another scripture that is a very important one, as far as I'm concerned. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Mm. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That simply means when the whole nation has no vision of what's going on, they have got the faintest idea in the world what they're doing. They're not being told by the government anything because the government is a big club and you ain't in it. And so they're telling you what they want you to know to keep you occupied. And 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 so until you realize that where there is no vision, the people are dying from a lack of knowledge. <clears throat> I think that is what the Catholic Church is doing for America. It's helping to keep our people ignorant ill-informed and make sure the mafia, the Cosa Nostra, and the organized crime around the world coming out of Rome, out of Italy. I mean, all you got to do is go back and watch Godfather 3, the third one in the series, Godfather 3, mm. where Michael Carleone, the mafia in, in New York, is inside the Vatican, dealing Secretary of State, and then you begin to see how organized crime is working hand in hand daily with the Vatican. So once you see how our world is really run and who's running things and how it works, it's going to shock you. It will shock you into realizing that the world we live in has been organized and directed a long time ago before you and your mother was ever born. Mm. There was already organized crime in Europe a thousand years ago. <clears throat> and you find out that Adolf Hitler was financed, organized, and directed the Nazi party by the Jesuits. The Jesuits are the brains behind the Nazi party. And the, and the Jesuit symbols are used in the Nazi party. The Jesuits are also responsible for responsible for giving the world today the Communist Party. The Soviet Union is a Jesuit operation. And and so today all over the world where you have communists still pushing their so-called democracy, the so-called Democratic Party, in Europe the communists are referred to as Christian Democrats. <laughs> There's a term that used to be all over Europe. It was called Christian Democrats. Christians because they are they were Jesuit, they were Catholic, so therefore they were Christian, and they were Democrats, were promoting their idea of democracy, which is dividing the people against each other and letting everybody have a piece of the action to get in a war and a fight with everybody else. And that's what's going on today. When you see all this invasion of the European culture, 
It's the same idea. The Vatican is destroying European civilization with the idea of of putting together something new, a new world order in which there will be no more individuality, no more creativity, no more uh, nationalism. There will be one big, happy, communist concentration camp called the New World Order. And the Vatican and the Jesuits are the brains behind it. Well, see, that's All the thing. Do, yeah, that, that, that's the thing about this, though, is the engineering of it. Right, uh, is, is self-evident because we, we talked about the clashes between these three religions. But yeah. let's just separate Judaism and Islam from the discussion for a second. Uh, you, you also talked about the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, all of these things which are allegedly offshoots of the Christian church, right? By right. design, they keep splintering. The Seventh-day Adventist gives you the Branch Davidian. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so forth. And look, I'm not even saying that, that, uh, <clears throat> David Koresh and his people were not executed by our government, by the way. I just want to make that clear. And that's not Jordan's view. That's mine. But the fact is that all of these different struggles, all of these different ideologies have been engineered by a fairly intelligent group. And I feel as though, even though in Europe there is the possibility of national identity, in a way, in the United States, it's not the same thing. And yet, the same design is at play because we don't really have a homogenous culture here. No. Because it has been evolving over time. And I, I've tried to struggle with this with some people who are very angry over the fact that they think, you know, they're being, they, they use the word invaded and we're being invaded now, you know, from our southern border and all this stuff. It's interesting because all of these things by design, Regardless of how the culture evolved on its own, uh, you know, you, you look at the, the cultures in the different parts of Europe, they were based on some pretty, again, sometimes very pragmatic reasons why they ate certain things, why they had certain behaviors. Uh, and this becomes part of their culture. In this country, like I said, it's a constantly evolving thing where it's being added, revised, there's new people coming in. There's new people that are literally parts of the fabric of America that a hundred years ago weren't even here. That's, That's the reality. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet the same design is at play where you're being literally manipulated into making sure that you're kept at each other's throats. Like in all of these places, like remember when I said there could be kinship between the three religions? Yep. Mm -hmm. If you accepted the story as is, I mean, let, let's just say you don't question, you don't dig, and most people don't. You should accept that there's some kinship there. It, it, to, to be on the same land, in the same country, there should be some accepted kinship. But what is always done, Jordan? There's always this, you need to believe in something. Here is your belief system. And now here's your enemies. It's like it's like a how-to guide to keep people constantly fighting with one another, as you said. Because well, that because way, because yeah. the church realizes Jesus said, "A house divided against itself can't stand. It will not last. A house divided against itself will not continue to exist." And so, if you are living in a house where everybody hates each other, just know that it's not going to last for long. They're going to be moving out, and they hate you, and you hate them, and so your a house divided against itself is not going to continue. And so that's what the Catholic Church wants to make sure, that we are the Roman Empire. They have set up their government in what we call New York, and Washington, D.C., as a Jesuit Vatican operation. Our government in the United States is a Jesuit Vatican Catholic organization, and the very organization we call the CIA, which is Central Intelligence Agency, was founded by the Knights of Malta, which is a Masonic order within the Vatican, a small group of very intelligent guys, very wealthy, living in and around the, the Vatican, and they founded what we call Washington, D.C. It's a Vatican operation. And so to make sure we don't, we as Americans just keep your mouth shut and do what we tell you to do, and we'll take over your country, 
and we'll send you wherever we want to and you fight for us and you do what we tell you to do and then you can have a you can have a life here and so today i believe that judaism is actually the second religion i to- i do i am totally convinced that judaism is not a bc religion it was not before our common era there was no ancient jerusalem no ancient israel the ancient never existed there was no such a thing as ancient israel it's just a story and that's why the bible is called the greatest story ever told it's a story it's all encoded and so i think that probably it was christianity that came first and then during the early middle ages from about the sixth seventh and eighth century a.d the knights templars who founded america the international banking cartels of europe who put up the money to found America, also put up the money to to give the Catholic Church the foundation to operate. And so they gave us Judaism. I believe Judaism is a creation of the Knights Templar, the Masonic Lodge inside the Catholic Church. The Knights Templars are the Masonic Order of Knights Templars. And it's a real dark and deep story, but that's why I'm saying Jews who go to uh, Jerusalem to worship at the uh, go, you know, worship at the uh, the uh, Wall Street and uh, and the, they're worshiping and praising God at the wall. They are actually praying to a Roman god. That's a Roman fort. Look it up in the dictionary. Write it down and look it up. It's called Fort Antonia, after the word Anthony. Fort Antonia is the Wailing Wall of Jerusalem, and in the encyclopedias it will tell you Fort Antonia is today called the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and the Jews are there sending their prayers to their God, and Fort Antonia, a Roman fort that has zero, nothing to do with Judaism or the Bible, period. It's purely a militaristic Roman fort. And the Jews are not told that. They go to their synagogues and are not told that. Mm. And there's a reason why in Israel the word synagogue is spelled S-Y-N or S-I-N in Israel. Synagogue is spelled S-I-N. But around the rest of the world, outside of Israel, it's spelled S-Y-N. So in America we have S-Y-N, synagogue. But in Israel it's S-I-N. Agog, synagogue. Why? Because the gods sin again. Sin was the moon god. So we have a synagogue, the house of the moon god, synagogue. And so I am totally sure that what we call Christianity was the Roman universal religion. Universal in Latin is Catholic. The word Catholic simply means universal. Therefore, air is Catholic. Water is Catholic. Because air and water are found all over the earth. It's universal. So therefore, Catholic means universal. So Rome was spreading its tentacles all over the world, even into what we call the New World. And so Rome, when it was ruling in Europe, it went into Britannia, what we call Britain. And where, 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 where did Caesar set up his base of operations in Britain when he came across the, the, uh, the canal and and landed in England, and he went into uh, England and set up a new government for Caesar. Where did he set it up? His base of operation in the Roman Empire's operation in Britannia was called York, England. And today we have a city uh, that's the center for our government is called New York. And New York is the Empire State. And this is why you have an empire state building. It's the state of the new Roman Empire. And so today our government is a Roman Empire government. And if you read the history books about Rome, it will tell you that Caesar each morning would officiate over the government of Rome. Where? Where did he go to his head office? And it says, in Rome, Caesar ruled the Roman Empire from something called Capitoline Hill. And so he went up on the hill each morning. And the, and the reference books say in the encyclopedias that Caesar each morning would go up on the hill 
to officiate over the Roman government, which was called the Roman Senate. And the Senate was up on the hill. Well, that's what we got today. We got the Capitol Hill. And Caesar is up on Capitol Hill officiating over the Roman Empire uh, for the U.S. Senate. The Senate is up on, on the on the hill. And so the United States is nothing more than a reestablishing of the Holy Roman Empire for the Vatican in the world today, on the earth today. And, it, and the Vatican is controlling through their military orders, their, which is the Jesuits. They're controlling our military, our police departments, our governmental systems, our federal and state systems. It's an incredible story about how the Vatican operates in America right in front of you and you didn't even know it. And that's why you're having the problems you are because the Roman Empire is destroying the foundations for all peoples around the world so that nobody will be able to put up a fight against Rome. And that's what we're doing. We're going all over the world, ripping people off and destroying governments and beating people into submission for the Holy Father. And that's why when the Holy Father comes here, all of the media... And all the big shots in, in politics, no matter who they are, no matter what party they belong to, when the Holy Father steps off the plane in New York, everybody crawls on their knees and shakes and shakes with uh, you know, with fear. They're in the presence of the Holy Father. Yeah, he worships God. He's a God Father. And therefore, there's nothing holy about Rome. Is the Roman universal religion in America is the new world order. And that's why it's on the back of the American dollar bill. It's a really incredible story of betrayal of human beings. We've been lied to and deceived so bad that we have no idea in the world what the real truth is. And that's what the church wanted to make sure we stay ignorant and deal informed and unread so we don't know what's going on. And, and always- I myself would like to wake people up to what's really happening right and always at each other's throats so with that i go to the last uh, uh piece that i wanted to talk about which was the cross itself mm-hmm. uh because uh the, the, this is a weird thing for me uh studying roman history uh revealed to me that um <clears throat> quite frankly there was no reason for there to be a cross used in crucifixion at the time that allegedly there was a guy named Jesus there that would have been crucified. Um, I like the way one one political pundit said, yeah, when they hung Jesus, when they nailed him to the cross, we call it a crucifixion. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a fiction, all right. It never happened. Oh, no, I got you. But but that's the thing is, even if you look at the history, though, uh, you find that there's an incongruity here, right? What of course. what does the cross symbolize? Um, you know, in short, because it 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 existed before there was even Christianity, according to the history, the way that we're told, there were crosses. It existed. It existed in ancient Egypt. The identical cross that we think of today existed all over the world in the ancient and prehistoric world of Egypt, Central America, South America, the temples of Incas and, and the, uh, and the, uh, you know, and Machu Picchu and all kinds of incredible places in Central and South America. You'll find the Christian cross and, uh, and especially in India, Africa, they always had the cross, but something interesting about the Christian cross in relation to religion is that for the first 600 years of Christianity, there was no symbol in any church anywhere on the earth, nowhere was there a, was there a picture of a man hanging on a cross. The man hanging on a cross we call Jesus was nowhere ever seen before the 600 A.D. 600 years after Christianity was founded, it was decided by the church that to make this more believable, you should put a man on the cross because more people will have sympathy if they see a man suffering. And so they put a man on the cross, and that's the first time in the Catholic Church you find a man hanging on a cross is in the 6th century. Six centuries, 600 years after Christianity was founded, they finally put a man on the cross. 
So what does that tell you? For 600 years, there was no man on a cross. And now today, it's everywhere. And when the, and when the sun goes down into the southern atmosphere, into the southern hemisphere, it goes down to Brazil. And when it hits the lowest point in the sky, it's the summer down there because it's winter up here in the northern hemisphere. And so if people in the southern hemisphere down in Rio and down in South America, when it's the summer, you go out at night and you will see the sun when it's setting. And there's a set of stars, I think it's like five or six stars, and they make up a perfect cross, just like a Christian cross. They make up a perfect cross. It is called, go on the web and type in Southern Cross. The Southern Cross constellation is a, is a, to, is a totally cross made up of five or six, uh, uh, uh of uh, stars and it's called the Southern Cross. And that's why the, the sun dies. And that's why we say that God's son is dead because he's got, he's died down south. He, He's no longer of any value to us. We're freezing up here with ice and snow, and we're freezing, and the sun is gone. But happily, he said he would return. And so every every winter and December 24th, December 25th, the sun rises on one degree northward, which tells us that the sun is now going to start coming back to the northern hemisphere. So he was dead for three days, and now he's moving again. And he's going northward. That means he's coming back to us. So that, so now he is now moving backwards to us. So now he's going to be revived and he's been re- resurrected. And so as he passes over the equator, the sun passes over the equator coming back to us. We call it the Passover. The Jews have a celebration called the Passover. Mm-hmm. The Passover is nothing more than the sun passing over the equator, coming back to the northern hemisphere. And ultimately, the sun is springing back to life because when it crosses the equator, all of a sudden the animals wake up, the flowers are growing, and and we're now getting the spring rains. We're getting rains in the spring. Everything is being uh, fertilized. The earth is coming to life, and, and all the ice is melting. And we are now going to be able to celebrate the spring. And so we call it the Passover. No, Christians don't call it the Passover. We call it the resurrection. Mm. It doesn't matter if it's a resurrection or a Passover because the sun has passed over the equator. It's the sun coming back to life. And so we say when the sun is coming back to life in the northern hemisphere, he's springing back to life. So we call that week spring. And so it's a spring wedding. We have spring is coming back, bringing the sun back to the northern hemisphere. It's very interesting to watch where all these religious teachings have come from. Watching the way the sun affects our solar system, the 12 signs of the zodiac are the 12 apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12, bra- the 12 stones on the, on the breastplate of the high priest. Everything in the Bible in the Old Testament was 12. That's right. There's only 12 signs of the zodiac. And, and the 13th one is the sun. So the sun with his chosen 12. And that's where our religions have come from. And so when you see that Moses comes down from the mountain of Mount Sinai, and he has a new religion for the Jewish people. Well, they've been worshiping God in the age of Taurus. Taurus the bull is one of the constellations of the zodiac. And so the sun is golden, and it's in the age of Taurus the bull, so it's a golden calf. This is why the Jews were worshiping a golden calf, because they're worshiping the sun in that 2,150-year cycle called Taurus. And Moses comes down to tell the people he's got a new religion. He talked directly with God and got a new religion. And they said, we don't want to hear about your new religion. It's a bunch of bull. We're interested only in what we've always done. We've always worshipped God as a golden calf, and we're going to continue to do it. We don't care what you say. And so he said, no, the next constellation of the zodiac is Aries, the ram. And God said that you should worship him in the air, in the constellation of Aries. The sun is the sun worship. That's what you're worshiping is the sun. 
And so the sun is in the age of Aries, the ram. So God said you should blow the ram's horn, the shofar. And today, the Jews today around the world blowing the shofar, never realizing they're celebrating their God, the sun, in the age of Aries, the ram. And what's the next one after Aries, the ram, or the next constellation is Pisces. And so now we have something called Christianity coming into the world with the age of Pisces. And Pisces is symbolized by two fish. And so when the 12 apostles find out that Jesus is going to sacrifice, he's going to die, in the book of Luke 22.10, if you go to the New Testament book of Luke, go to 22.10, it says that the 12 apostles went to Jesus and they said, now that you're going to die and you're going to leave us, you're going to leave the age of Pisces, and now you're going into a new new place, like Moses was telling us. It's a new religion. So the 12 apostles asked Jesus, where are you going to go? Where do we go? What's going to happen to us if you leave? And Jesus said, go into the city, and you will see a man with a water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with a water pitcher. Everybody who's ever studied theology knows man never carried water in the ancient world, nor today. Men don't carry water. It was very unmanly to carry water. Women carried water. That's why Jesus talked with the women at the well, not the men at the well. Men did not go near a well. Women drew the water and brought it home. And so when Jesus said, go into the city, and you'll see a man with a pitcher of water, go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. Well, the house of the man with the water pitcher is, of course, the house of Aquarius. That's what we call the constellations a house. And this is why the Christians have a song that's called, In My Father's House Are Many Mansions, a very famous song in Christianity. That's not what it says in the original scripture. It doesn't say, in my father's house are many mansions. What it says is not house, but the word is abode. Abode is where you live. Mm. And so where God lives is called his abode. And so the correct, the correct way to say this is, in my father's abode are many houses. Yeah, there's about 13 of them, the 12, the 12 signs of the Zodiac and plus another one. So, yeah, there's many houses. Uh, in my father's abode, there are many houses. That's right, houses of the Zodiac. Right. And hey, so Jordan, the, there, there's actually a caller on the line, which I would yeah. uh, like to try because we're running low on time. I'd like to try and add in. Uh, okay. Just to, just to see how this goes here. So hopefully, let's see, I'm going to take you off hold now. Okay. Um, there we go, Let's 209 area code. You're on the air with uh, Jordan Maxwell and myself. Um, hi, Mr. Maxwell. Thank Hello. you for all what you do. Uh, thank you for all what you do and uh, and all that you say. Um, my question is is about our, found, our founding fathers. Um, basically, were they uh, hermetics, her- hermetists? They were mostly uh, what we would call, uh, what's the term? The, the founding fathers were her- not. Her- yeah, hermeticists. Her- hermeticists? Hermeticists. Okay. They were, they so were they, not Christians. Right. They is were is called, that the original religion? Is that the yeah. r- original religion? The, the, founding fathers, the founding fathers were what we call deists. They were deists, okay. not Christians. Deists. Deists means. You believe that there is some kind of a God, but you don't know what it is, but there sure seems to be some kind of intelligence that's guiding the human race and uh, and some kind of a creator that's causing things to happen. And so God is called Dios. And so, therefore, if you are founding father, we were, they were saying that they were Dios. They believed that there was a divine presence in the universe that caused things to happen. And so they were called Dios. Not Christians. They were deists, and they okay. believed that in God. They believed in God. And my, my, my next question, I don't want to keep you too long, but my next question is, okay, so, uh, since the original founding fathers were on the right track as as uh, knowing how the, the stars and, and the constellations 
in, in, on, in, the, in the heavens or in space, uh, how, as above, so below. Well, Mr. What's his name? Mr. Payne was basically saying that, just like you always say, that the Vatican flipped that, that whole concept as above, so below concept and captured it for themselves and tricked us. Is that true? Yes. And also, when you hear the word kingdom of God, this is something I thought was important. When you hear someone talk about the kingdom of God, we humans have a have a, 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 a habit of putting different life forms into some kind of a family arrangement. Like fish are in schools, ants are in colonies, cows are in herds. Uh, you know, we put we put all kinds of living creatures into different the different families. So what kind of what kind of a creature do we humans say are in a kingdom? We are talking about an animal kingdom. The animals are in a kingdom. And so therefore when you say the kingdom of God is the kingdom is it goes back to an animal. And in the ancient Greek the word animal was connected to the word zoology. Zoo, uh, zoo. that's where you find animals is in a zoo. And so the kingdom of God is the zodiac, the zoo, zodiac, the kingdom of animals. And there's 12 of them. In my father's abode, there are many houses. Yeah, there's 12 of them. And they're called the kingdom of God, the 12 animal houses around us. So in the ancient world, the stars were called astars. They spell it A-S-T-A-R, astar. We don't, we don't do it that way. We spell it S-T-A-R. But the ancient peoples in the, in the beginning of, of Christianity in English in Europe, they spell star A-S-T-A-R. And therefore they said, the church said, if you don't understand the star, A-S-T-A-R, the Astars, if you don't understand their their influence on us, the Astars, then your life is going to be a dis-Astar. And today, that's what we have. All over America, people are living a disastrous life. Why? Because they don't understand the heavens. That's where God is. And in my father's house are many mansions, no a mansion is where you live, and so therefore my father's abode are many houses of the zodiac, the astars. And so if you don't understand the zodiac, your life is going to be a dis-astar. Do you understand? Uh, absolutely. So does, does that mean that when they say the Messiah is going to come, the Messiah is never going to come because we're all divided. Yeah. The only way the Messiah will come is that if we all start reading the stars, right? That's that exactly true? right. Then the Messiah will come. The Messiah is a spiritual work. It's a spiritual dynamics, not a man. There's not going to be a man coming to save the world. Nobody's going to come to save the world. It's going to be very difficult for Jesus to come back when he's never been here to start with. So Messiah goes right. back to it's the Messiah, word Messiah goes back to the Egyptians. They're the ones that came up with the idea of a Messiah. And so the Egyptians gave us that term, Messiah. And so the sun is always going to come back as the invincible sun. It's always coming back. Even though it goes down south and it dies in the winter, it always comes back to us. So he is the invincible sun. And you don't own it. God owns it. So it's God's sun, the light of the world. And there's only one son, thank God. We don't have six sons, so there's only one son. So he's the only begotten of the Lord. God has given us one son, and he's our Savior. And, of course, the so son Mr. is your Savior. Mr. Maxwell, do you, do you think we're gonna, ever going to get it? Are, they, are we just too far gone with the, with the fiction? I think that we're way too far gone. I don't think the people want to hear the truth. I don't think they want to hear. I do believe that there's going to be a lot of people who will want to know and who will start doing their homework. And that's why I'm offering them my website where they can start. If you really want to know, go to Jordan Maxwell Show. Three words, Jordan Maxwell Show and join my research society. And this is where I'm giving you all of this information.
But I don't mm-hmm. think the world is interested. I don't think the people of this world are even a slight bit interested. They want to fill their be- they want to fill their bellies with food and and beer and watch the ball game and entertainment, and they couldn't care less what the real truth is. But if you're supposed to know, you will know. Knocking it will be open, seeking you will find, and asking it will be given. And that's what I'm saying you need to do. If you want to know, then contact me on Jordan Maxwell's show, and I will show you all the things that you have never been told before about right. where the real truth is. And uh, my, my friend on the phone, can I ask, uh, can, can I have a name that I can call you by? Because <laughs> you're the first guy to call in. Uh-huh. While well, Jordan was on, so. Wow. Well, I hope my name is Charles Ross, and um, I did. I wrote you uh, about two months ago, around December, Mr. O'Shelley, in regards to uh, the story about uh, I heard on the news that uh, one day slipped a satellite out to Cassiopeia, and uh, I guess they heard Mr. Maxwell talk about it. <laughs> Oh I'm yeah, yeah. We on. we talked about it right here on the. We, we talked about it during this show uh, with Cassiopeia and uh, all of that, didn't we? Uh, it was it was yes, really that's interesting. Right. That's right. Listen, man, I I really appreciate you for for calling in, asking great questions, and uh, I, I know Jordan appreciates it as well. Believe it or not, we're over time a little bit, but I didn't want to cut you off. Uh, I'm going to put you back on no, hold no. though. Uh, right now, and but but really, I appreciate you calling in, and and thank you so much for interacting with the show as you have. He's written in before Jordan uh, regarding yes. certain things, and uh, it has definitely been paying attention. You know, he's one of those people who's actually picking up the information you're laying down, uh, and of course, the best place to do that to uh, get the information from Jordan and all of the work that Jordan has done over nearly sixty years, but. <clears throat> We can easily say more than a half century. Uh, you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. You got to put all three of those words together because that is the only website, and I do mean the only website, that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. jordanmaxwellshow.com. There's the Research Society over there, which I am a member of. It's got a one-time membership fee. Uh, there is uh, an email contact, the donate button, all those things, plus a public area. But, Jordan, I do appreciate you for doing this with me. And, you know, even though we're at episode 20, uh, I do believe we're going to continue. And I hope that just like Charles here who called in, which, by the way, good name, Charles, uh, you know, <laughs> Chuck Charles, you, you, you get it, right? Anyway, um, uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you for calling in. I want to thank you guys for listening. But most of all, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Maxwell, for educating us as you have. And if you want to continue your education, you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com because, again, that is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Are we going to do this again next week, Jordan? I would love to, yes. Let's do it. Absolutely. So episode 21 next week on Monday night here on ocelli.com. But for now, this is all done. Again, Jordan Maxwell, the series on religion, jordanmaxwellshow.com. It's his website. 